Whoops, just getting my microphone on. Sorry, folks. Just gonna start this lecture any minute. Just make sure I've got a editor screen up, just in case I do a bit of coding. Gotta make sure I'm ready for coding. there almost ready to start okay tablet remote controls there I got my bottle of water tablet I think Just make sure I've got that organized and that it's working sometimes my tablet weirdly when it's connected to Linux it goes into some kind of um, Android mode and it stops working which is very very strange G'day folks, welcome and thank you for joining me here today. I'm just going to ping us on the teams, ping everyone on the team, make sure that um, if anyone's waiting around for a lecture, then they'll be jumping in. Lecture videos at team. Lecturing now on recent developments. Ooh. We've got an interesting lecture for you today, a bit of a, a change of pace, I suppose. Um, doing some slightly different, um, a slightly different stream of work in the, over the next three weeks or four weeks until the end of the semester. Um, and the reason that things are changing is because you're now working on your major projects. So we've done all of the assignments for this, this um, course you've handed them in we're marking them having a look at that and you're on your major project that means that you have all of the basic tools you need to do your major project and what I will be doing in lectures from now on is providing this kind of continual inspiration and stimulus and suggestions and feedback to you that you might be able to uh, embrace over time or wind into your project in some way or give you um, deepen your knowledge about art and interaction computing, which will allow you to produce a better project um, on top of the basic, um, the basic skills that you already have. I'm just going to make myself small from now and for the remainder of the lecture. I am recording, right? I always need to double check that, otherwise it's very embarrassing to change it later or forget to have recorded. Hmm. Where are we at with the course? Admin corner. That's the admin tune. Remind me of that next week. The rest of this course is all focused on the major project, as I said. I sure hope that everyone has had a look at the major project on the website. Um, you really should have done that. We'll have a look together in a second. The the major project is serious business in terms of an assessment item. It's half the assessment for this course. 50% of your final mark is what you do in your major project. So uh, I know that everyone's been developing their skills and they've, they've got their skill set being leveled up or will be continuing to be leveled up over the next few weeks. 
but I just need to express this concept that when we have a 50% assessment, it's worth, or we expect a, a much higher level of effort and polish than for the 15% assessments that you had in your um, smaller um, assignments. And I know some folks were putting in different amounts of effort into these assignments. There are, there are folks who, um, you know, just want to put, uh, keep that limited to a few days. There are some folks who are working for days and days and weeks thinking about their assignments. Um, oh, for the final project, I expect that everyone is developing their work over a number of weeks. It's not something that you just um, come up with in two days right before the deadline. Of course, everyone will be working pretty hard on that just before the deadline to make sure that their ideas are working. But your ability to successfully do something in those few days before the deadline will often depend on how much you put in in the weeks beforehand. So you're doing the preparatory work so that then you can get your final ideas in order in those last few days or the last week just before the deadline. Um, and that's why all of the labs from this week onwards have been to do with your major project. I'm just going to open this up in a tab, but I'm not going to look at that right now. I think I might just, I've got a few slides about the major project, as I will have every lecture from now. The major project. What is it that you're supposed to do? The, the description for the major project or the spec is that you should be creating an interactive artwork to be displayed in a gallery. And I know this, this seems a little bit abstract when we're in this world of, um, of remote learning, people everywhere, folks in Australia are in lockdown. Hopefully all of the, the students in Australia who are involved in the course will not be in lockdown by the time we get to the, the, the due date for the major project. But that doesn't mean that we'll be able to um, really do anything on ANU campus. The, the campus is, is still closed to us at the moment, uh, sadly. But what we can do is just, I wanted to show you what this would look like in a, in a gallery. So this is a, an image from um, actually a previous iteration of this course where the major projects were displayed on computers in one of our computer labs at ANU. So you can see folks are um, hanging out in a darkened space in a gallery environment looking at these um, these things on the on the computer screens and um, then there's they're interacting with them they're having a good time they're looking at them and you can imagine what the experience would be for one of these viewers they would walk into a room see a lot of things on computer screens and think hmm what am I going to interact with now so your artwork needs to have some kind of um, appeal to them, some kind of hook, some kind of call, some kind of affordance that's obvious that makes them want to, to play with it um, and start interacting and start experiencing your artwork. So there's just been a question in the chat which is really important about requirements. I'll address that in a minute. Um, let's just think about this. Your major project is an interactive P5 artwork for a new media art exhibition, an interactive art exhibition. Folks in this environment are able to walk around and may interact with your work. So it's not guaranteed that someone will interact. I want you to keep this in mind. When your work is on the wall in a gal gallery, people have to walk by, do, 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 say, hello, that looks interesting, and come and interact with it. So in some sense, it's important that you appreciate the fact that you need to reach your viewer just having a kind of passive screen as the starting point for your artwork may not be such a good idea. Um, you'll work with your tutors on this concept of, of mapping out the experience. But I think that um, you know, you've already started to think about this with your storyboards about what is the, the start of the experience for viewers, what, what in, uh, invites them to interact with your artwork. Now the, the high level goal is to provide your your viewers with an engaging experience of roughly three minutes. So we've gone from a 30 second experience in, in the advertisement that you just handed in to a, a three minute experience exploring your project theme. Um, just thinking about my my slides. Oh, yeah, I know what, what I'm doing now. I will go back to the show you the the 
the assignment page and look at those requirements again in a second. Now, we've got a theme for the major project. You're doing a lot of work in your labs interpreting this theme and imagining new interpretations. Remember that you can interpret the theme however you like as long as there's a clear connection and that you can articulate that connection in your, uh, as a statement. Um, but make sure you're reading the requirements. Again, we'll go to those in a minute. Now, your, everyone in the class will now have made a storyboard as their first, um, first bit of work in their assignment, which is amazing. Um, I've been seeing some wonderful storyboards going by in the pre-labs. Um, the task for next week is actually to make a start on your major project, which is kind of wild. We're quite a few weeks away and I'm telling you to start your assignment now. And in fact, I'm requiring you to do it in order to get marks for your lab next week. So by the end of next week, everybody in the class should have forked their assignment and made at least one commit and completed the pre-lab task, which is, which is there. So you know, you know who you are in the class. If you forget to fork and commit code to your assignment until the last minute, um, you often find that a few days before I start messaging you and <laughs> saying, come on, get your assignment started. I want to make sure there's no mistakes. I have found in this class, there have been folks emailing me a few hours before the deadline for the assignment in a panic because they can't get something to work. That's why I I'm reminding you to start early so that you do get things to work early. I will be checking. If you do not complete the pre-lab exercise next week, you will hear from me. I will be asking you why you haven't started your assignment yet, why you're not doing the pre-labs, what's going wrong, are you okay, do I need to send help, do I need to have a helicopter come and assess your situation and make sure you're able to do your major project. I'm doing this out of care for you, not out of some kind of like police um, thing or I'm trying to enforce uh, certain standards. I, I really care about the projects everyone creates and I know that you care about your projects and I wanna see everyone achieve the, the vision that they have for their major project. And doing that effectively really means starting early. So that's just, just a fact of life with big projects. Um, let's just take a backtrack and look at the requirements for the assignment. Major project, due date, 9 p.m. Australian Eastern Daylight Savings Time, Monday, November the 1st, 2021. Our policy for assignments is unchanged. We don't accept late ex submissions. I do hand out extensions for folks who have a good reason, who uh, find that they're in trouble towards their deadline. If you do find that you're in trouble towards the deadline, get in touch with me. This is a 50% assignment. Obviously, if you don't hand this in, um, you won't be able to pass the course. So if anyone is having any issues completing their assignments on time, um, make sure that you are um, coming to me asking for an extension and we can discuss that um, if that happens. Really, I, I would rather have a conversation about an extension than have someone assume that they can't get one. So please, if you need one, if you're in trouble, if you can't get your work done on time, you're not gonna be able to meet that deadline, talk to me about it. Now, the, the spec here explains basically what I've been talking about, that this is an interactive P5 artwork. The scenario is that people walk around the gallery and observe various works and they may interact with them. So your goal is to make something engaging that lasts about three minutes. And I really don't have any more restrictions uh, or re restrictions about the format or kind of um, instructions about what to do than that. The experience should last about three minutes. The reason for this is that there are some fo folks who want to have multiple scenes in their artworks. There are some folks who have one single scene which evolves in some way. So if I said you have to have three scenes, then the folks who want to do the evolution kind of system or the evolving single scene um, will feel like their, their artistic vision isn't possible. Um, so this could be an interactive generative artwork, one kind of scene. It might be some kind of storytelling experience with a narrative. You get to choose that. The exact nature of this experience is up to you. What you will get over the next few weeks is some quite candid feedback from your tutors about your idea for your artwork. 
do not be surprised if if you go to a lab and you tell your tutor, my idea for the artwork is this, they say, look, I have heard you, but I think you should reconsider that idea. That is, that is going to be very difficult to make. It may not work as well as you think. It's not quite matching the spec of an interactive P5 artwork. Um, the reason we have this feedback for you is because we find that students choose some, some way of going and then do a bunch of work in the implementation and then later on they think, oh, well, this is not working very well, but I've already done all this work. So the implementation work is it's easier to, to change now, several weeks before it's due, than to have to fix that later. So we, we have a policy with our tutors. We give quite candid feedback. That means you might not hear what you want to hear. You might hear that your idea is potentially not the best idea. Um, and I don't mean that in no way is that insulting towards you or making any kind of judgment on you as a person. We're simply trying to encourage you to iterate on ideas and embrace the, the artistic and interactive concepts we discuss in this course. There's a certain amount of um, uh, kind of negative energy around this concept of making a game in this course. I really encourage people to think beyond a game. I know that we as people who often, if you're in this course, you probably enjoy computers. That means you probably enjoy playing computer games. So it's a, it's a really interesting interactive media and uh, art form, but it's not the same as an interactive artwork. And we've gone through the reasons for that in this course. I go back to lectures in weeks five and six. We talked at length about games and, and art, where they're the same, where they're different, or where they have relationships and where they're quite different. Um, the, the, the reason we suggest don't make a game is because if you take that as your starting point, I want to make a game, you end up with something which isn't art, an artwork enough to do well. And I really want everyone to do well and meet their, their vision. So the, another reason not to make a game is that making games is terrifically hard. It's incredibly hard to make a good game. Imagine if you people start making a game, they think, I need a lot of uh, characters, I need to develop all these resources, I need to have music, I need to compose music. So it's games are terribly hard to, to work. They're very high-end art, art forms. And it's really something which is beyond the scope of the major projects to make a good game. That's, a, that's even a harder problem. So I really think you should think beyond that and think about the, the artistic suggestions I've been making. Someone's asking about using touch-related functions. Um, that would only work if the, um, the viewer was using a touch-based device. You need to assume that the person viewing your assignment is using a lab computer. So this is, the, this is why I'm showing you this slide. They are in a lab with a lab computer. There's a camera there, it may have a camera. It, it probably has speakers. I'll draw things on nicely. You know, probably has some speakers, so you can use sound if you want. It's maybe has a camera here, so you can use a camera if you really want to. Um, you don't know what the lighting conditions are going to be, so using a camera can be a bit dangerous. They've got a mouse, they've got a keyboard. Um, do they have touch? No, probably not on this computer. So my computer doesn't have a touch screen, my laptop doesn't have a touch screen, obviously my iPad does, my phone does, but if you're sending me a major project which requires touch in order to make sense of it, then um, I think that's quite a dangerous thing to be doing and it might, um, it might cause some issues with how that's graded. Um, I would say in this course, like people often me ask, ask questions, can I do this, can I do that? And I say, mm, maybe not such a good idea. What does that mean? That means that it's probably really hard to make that work well. It doesn't mean that it's impossible, but I'm trying to give good advice. It also doesn't mean that if you go down that road, you'll automatically fail. Like we, we don't fail students automatically for doing good projects, um, for, for using doing something which is a little bit out of the ordinary. Obviously we don't do that, that would be crazy. We, we assess everyone on the quality of their, their interactive artwork holistically. So. Um, there are always, in every year we have hundreds of students, there are folks who do some things which are, are pretty strange to most of us, 
just because in any group of 200 people, there are some people who are thinking like in a quite a different direction than all of us. Um, in general, they, what will happen is just what I said would happen, which is that maybe the idea didn't work out as well as they thought, um, but they're not going to fail if the, the rest of the artwork is there. Um, feel free to shoot any other questions in you have um, about the, the artwork, and I can address some more at the end. I'm just going to say a few more things. We have requirements here. Your major project is a P5 sketch. If you're not using P5 in your project, you haven't met that requirement. So you do need to use P5 in some way. Of course, you can also alter the, the HTML files. Um, but really, that's a dangerous thing to do, to do a lot of stuff that's not in P5. Why is it dangerous? We don't teach it in this course. How am I supposed to assess it against everybody else if you're doing things that are completely different? Um, the major project much, must allow interaction using either the keyboard, mouse, microphone, camera, or some interaction of those, not touch. Provide an engaging interactive user experience of roughly three minutes. Relate to the theme in a meaningful way. Be suitable for public presentation, viewing, and interaction. So you can't make an obscene artwork. You can't make something which would be unsuitable for children. Um, you can't make something which uh, I have to put a content warning on for the tutors. Um, to protect them from some content that they might want to see. <laughs> Someone saying when you need to use MATLAB for your idea. Um, yeah, the sunglasses are going on for that, that uh, suggestion, but that is not a good idea. Please use P5. Number five, have well-organized source code. You're using functions, arrays, objects, and all the techniques discussed in lectures. You've got an artist statement. You've got an interaction statement. We'll talk about those next week. If you're a Comp 70, 6720 student, you have met the special requirements below. I've, we'll talk about that in a, in a minute in our, uh, in our work. You've got a statement of originality. You know the drill with those now. You've included a thumbnail. You know the drill of how to do that. Your, your sketch runs smoothly in, in the test URL. So that means you have to have uploaded it early enough for the, the jobs to finish um, at any canvas size. So make sure you try in different windows send it to your friends to try. Um, if we were on campus, we could say try it in the labs. Obviously that isn't possible at the moment, but just try it in different, different size windows. We are gonna talk about other parts of this, the artist statement requirement and the interaction requirements later, but basically today I just wanted to go through the main requirements. Um, and of course, your tutors will be checking up on you over this process. Okay, where were we? So, I should say one thing. The next two weeks you have labs that are marked, week 10 and week 11, where you have to do things about your major project. And I saw many, many good ideas for the major project in the storyboards uh, lab this week. But looking through the, the entries on the pre-lab channel, I did see some that weren't using the the uh, they weren't following the requirements for the pre-lab exercise. If you don't follow those requirements, we're not going to give you marks for that pre-lab task. So just be careful, make sure you do follow the requirements. I really expect everyone to be engaging with this regularly. These shouldn't take too long. There are people who made storyboards that look like they took about 15 seconds, and yet they are sufficiently expressing their vision in order to have that good conversation with their lecturer, with their tutor, I mean, um, in their lab. So you, it may not take a long time to meet that pre-lab requirement, but you must do it in order to meet, um, pass those um, small tasks. It's not a lot of marks in the pre-labs, but it's, it's just showing you what our expectation is, meeting these um, requirements. Now, what are we gonna do today? We're going beyond and we're getting up to date. So we've talked a lot about art from maybe first half of the 20th century in this course, earlier in the course, thinking about art, what is art, color, interaction, abstract art, variation, etc. We don't cover everything about programming P5 and art in this course, but we do cover enough that you can make a great major project from now. You know about sounds, you know about um, images, you know about functions, arrays, etc. And now we're going to look a bit beyond the basics and just think about some recent developments in art and interaction computing. 
um, and how this relates to computer science as well. So why do we do this? If you're a 1720 student, this is a good chance to get inspired and engaged with the world of interactive art um, and see what's happening in the world. You can engage with the academic discussion and, and read articles and papers written by artists and researchers. And if you're a 6720 student, it's a little bit different. You get that chance for the above. You get that chance for the above, but also it's a course requirement. <laughs> it's actually a requirement. The, um, the major project requirements have um, special extra paragraphs for 6720 students, which basically relate to making sure that you can explain how your major project reflects recent developments in interactive art. Uh, and this is actually because the learning outcomes for 6720 students are different, they're a bit more advanced. Because you're master's students, you're expected to be able to engage with um, the, the academic discourse, the academic um, papers around the world, to do your own research, and to really take your knowledge up to date. Um, for everyone who's an undergraduate, even though I expect a lot of you, I don't expect that yet. Um, just because of the level of your degree program, naturally a master's degree program is, is a little bit requiring a little bit more of students than the undergraduate programs. There's another question came up about requirements. I might um, think about that one in the end, uh, or I'll just address it right now. What if someone gets bored quickly? <laughs> They're not going to get bored quickly. My job, I am going to examine your major projects and I don't get bored easily. I look at these and I see, is there about three minutes content here? and I'm very good at judging. I've marked hundreds of major projects. Where people don't meet the three minute requirement is because they have have a very shallow interaction. So any interaction which you think will should last about three minutes, you show it to your friends, they seem to play with it for a couple of minutes, you show your tutor, they seem to play with it for a couple of minutes, then you should be fine, right? <laughs> this is not, there's no, no chance involved here. I'm very interested in making sure to understand everyone's interactions and make sure that I'm not even putting a stopwatch on. I'm just making sure that there's enough there for roughly three minutes. So in today's lecture, we're going to make a start on this recent developments concept, cover some fundamentals, and then over the next three weeks, we'll look at specific topics in within recent developments that have good connections with P5, and those would be data art, simulations, and artificial life in art and creative machine learning in week 12, super fun topic. So these are all topics that are really important to me and I think we've got, there's great ways to talk about how to do those kind of things in P5. Um, if you wanna watch those lectures now, you can watch last, last year's version on YouTube if you're really keen, but otherwise you can wait and see as, as we go over the next few weeks. So what is a recent development? What is a recent development? A, in my view, a recent development would be something that happened in the last 15 years. So I'd like to say 10 years maybe, but um, I'd like to keep my artworks within the recent developments because I don't want to feel old yet. So I'm going to make it 15 years. What we're talking about is, uh, uh, what we're talking about is, in this lecture is some work which does start in the 90s and early 2000s. So I'm going to talk a bit about some earlier papers, um, but mainly the examples I'm going to discuss come from the last 15 years. Some resources that would help if you're thinking about this recent developments question, I'll just point this out now. First of all, lectures since week five, go back and watch those lectures, see all the examples I've given. And also I've created a bibliography for you, which is a bit un, a bit of a, mount, a word soup right now. It is literally just a reference section. This is not annotated, but it's papers and resources and books um, that can help you um, understand how art and interaction has, has changed over the last 15 years. And I'm adding to this all the time. These are all of the papers that I've mentioned in the lectures so far. So there's quite a few here and some I'm, I'm talking about today and some maybe I haven't talked about because I was just taking some inspiration from them. But feel free, if particularly if you're a 6720 student, start going through this list. I'll point out some important ones today. You can find that linked in the lecture. A broad point, art and interaction is related to 
this thing called human computer interaction, which is a field of study in computer science. So human computer interaction, human computer interaction, often called HCI, is the field of study about how people use computer systems and how we design them to, to work well for humans. And within HCI as a field, which has been around since the 60s really, there's been a move in how people study interactions. In earlier HCI work, people were really interested in ease of use, right? How easy is it to use a computer system? And now we're talking about experience. What's the user's experience in the computer system? Are you seeing that some of the words here are similar to how I've been discussing interactive art? Because the interactive artworks, we've been trying to work out what the viewer's experience is in navigating that artwork. So it's a very similar concept. Designing an interactive artwork is similar to how to design an interactive computer system. Um, <laughs> there's, there's two little questions in the, in the comments I'll just address right now. Someone said, if we let other, other students test our project, should we reference them? Um, if you want to, if they've given you ideas, then if they've come back and told you an idea, then yes, reference them. Um, by the way, whenever you put your code on the test server, it is public, so other people could look at it. I think that that's a good thing. I want everyone to be looking at everyone else's assignment. Um, the, I, I don't think we're going to have any, any issues of academic integrity related to you showing your assignment to people and seeing if they can use it for more than three minutes. But obviously, if, if you have tested someone else's assignment and you've borrowed some idea from them through discussion, then you would need to put that into your SOO. Um, so I'm, I, I know that folks are really worried about the edge cases here, but it, it tends not to be a big problem. Um, please share your assignment with your friends. Show your mum, show your dog, show your little brother, um, show your goldfish, um, and see how everyone interacts with it. Back to HCI. Ease of use and experience. So within artworks, we're really thinking about not just any old interactions, like interacting with Microsoft Word, we're talking about creative interactions. So in fact, within HCI, there's also been a move towards studying tools that support creativity. So um, for example, there's a, a, word, a term called creativity support tools, which could be, um, <laughs> which could be, that, that would be pet computer interaction, animal computer interaction, someone's put in the, in the chat, which is actually a field, a subfield of HCI. So you can go and look up papers on animal computer interaction. Sorry, that's a massive sidebar. Creativity support tools could be anything from Photoshop, Microsoft Word obviously can help people be creative as writers. Photoshop makes them, lets them make artworks. Um, and P5 as well as a creativity support tool. It's something that lets you create interactive artworks. And so here's a reference um, from someone called Ernest Edmonds, a very important researcher in interactive art and HCI. And, and he wrote in 2018, there's been a move in HCI from routine work and productive concerns like Microsoft Word and spreadsheets to human and creative ones like creating art. Um, and I've got a link to Edmonds book here called The Art of Interaction, What HCI Can Learn from Interactive Art. And if you want to go and read one academic book about interactive art, this is a good one. It's, he explains what HCI is, he explains what interactive art is, he has some examples of interactive artworks that he's been involved in. Um, he's got a deep connection with Australia, he, he lived in, uh, worked at the University of Sydney for some time, sorry, not University of Sydney, I think University of Technology Sydney, my mistake. Um, and is related to, to many folks within the Australian art scene who create interactive artworks. A great book to read. There's a link to the ANU library where you can read it. So creativity support tools. There was some research by a, a quite famous HCI researcher called Ben Schneiderman and his many co-authors. Um, it was published around 2006. There's some other ones published in 2007 about what it is we do when we're creating creativity support tools, things like P5. But this also kind of relates to creating interactive artworks. Many of this, these design principles matter. Support exploration, support many paths and many styles, support collaboration, well, that's not as important for, for you folks. Make it as simple as possible and maybe even simpler. Invent things that you would want to use yourself. Make an artwork that you would like to use. 
balance user suggestions with observation and participatory processes. So when you're asking people about to try out your artwork, they often give you advice, take the advice on board, but then also actually look at how they're using your artwork, observe what they're doing and, and take that as your advice. Because often people who give you advice, outsiders who just try your system once, maybe they don't have the best advice. Iterate, iterate, then iterate again. Classic bit of advice we've, we've discussed before. So there's lots of, lots of good bits of advice here that you can look at. Um, this is a very famous quote, low threshold, high ceiling and, and wide walls. What does that mean? Creativity support tools should be easy to get started in, like P5, very easy to get started in. And they've got a high ceiling, which means you can make things which are as crazy and difficult as possible. And some folks in this class are certainly doing that. And they've got wide walls, which may, means you can make all different types of things. So you can get in very easily. You can, you know, go for the, the stars and make something really complicated. But you can also go in lots of different directions, wide walls. So bringing this back to what artists do, creating artworks, within HCI, there's often been a view that artists are, are a kind of power user of computing systems. Artists demand a lot of their systems because they're trying to create, um, trying to create computer, interactive computer systems that are at the boundary. They have an excess of je ne sais quoi. That's what artists do. They're trying to do things that are advanced and sublime and excellent in that, that way that art is. So when we have artists creating interactive computer systems, that's a really interesting thing to study because they really push the tools. They're not just creating a document in Microsoft Word, they're creating the biggest document or something so crazy that it might crash Microsoft Word um, because that's, that's how they're feeling. And I think this, this is what some of you folks are doing because you're making things that crash browsers. Um, that's being an artistic power, a creative power user. You put so much, you make an object in your browser and then you say, uh, okay, I want to have 10,000 of those, please. And then the browser is like, <clears throat> and can't handle it. Uh, there's been a few assignments going by that we're very interested in, in how you've managed to make them so resource intensive on, on our modern computers, but very interesting. So studying interactive art gives us insight into the potential of creativity support tools. And that also brings back findings into everyday creativity for, for other folks who aren't artists. Why am I telling you this? I'm going to get to the point in a minute. Interactive art and human computer interaction have important connections. The research about interactive arts often wrapped up in HCI research, so they're related. And we're going to look at some big concepts and a few examples over the next few slides. So the first one is data. Um, this is a, an image of a system called TreeViz which is one of these early, an early system for looking at the contents of your hard drive, right? Um, how do you um, represent some, some data in a structured way? I think every, everyone will have seen this kind of tool when they're trying to clean up their hard drive now. Um, but it was actually invented by Ben Schneiderman or his team uh, many years ago. Uh, we're going to talk more about data art in week 10 next week. But just to mention now that being able to transform data into an artistic in, ex, uh, exploration and an artistic experience is very much a part of interactive art today. Um, I'm thinking of the many kinds of data artworks I've seen based on concepts about climate change, based on COVID-19, looking at case numbers, based on understanding complex systems. Um, artists are using their creative skills to help communicate about complicated problems by looking through data. So we'll see more about that next, next time. Sensors and hardware. This is something which is, is really interesting. It's happened pretty much since 2005-ish. Um, artists really getting deeply into hardware and that being much more accessible. So artists have always been creating interesting hardware systems. If you think back about some of my early lectures, there were interactive artworks with, with um, quite interesting computer systems, but they were often custom made and took a long time and a lot of expertise. And what's happened in the last 15 years is systems to make it very accessible for using custom, um, for using embedded computing systems and using sensors to create artworks. So this is an example of a, a board called a Bella, which is created by some, some friends of mine at um, uh, 
in London, um, and uh, the the point of this system is to allow allow a kind of easy introduction to how to build musical interaction systems with a, a small computer. And it is quite easy to, to, to get started. It does have that low threshold and then wide walls and a high ceiling. You can go as complicated as you like. In this project, I combine this with this muscle sensor called a Myo. You put that on your wrist, on your arm, and it would measure the location of your arm as well as how tense your muscles were. So it's kind of doing gesture recognition as well as the recognition of your arm's movement in space. That's a really cool sensor. So that's connected to this system by Bluetooth. And then there'd be some sound happening on the headphones. So in, in this project, I actually um, worked with a, a group to create a, a musical work called Stillness Under Tension, which was a, a quartet for four of these systems and four Myos. And I'll, I'll send you a video. I haven't got a link here right now, but the concept of this artwork was that the, the more still you were, the louder your sound was. So it was kind of a, an upside down version of, of doing musical uh, interaction. And that, that concept of inverse interaction was invented by this guy, Alexander Refsum Yancinius. Another system using this, or another idea using this same system was this installation, interactive artwork called Svarm Resonance. It used a different kind of sensor. You can see it just here. Um, this is my friend Agata, and just looking at her face is this little distance sensor, which just detects how m close she is to the guitar. And when she got close to the guitar and then stood still, again using the stillness concept, the, gu the guitar would have a little speaker on the back and it would start to sing with a particular sound. And then when there were six of these guitars in the venue, they would sing with this, um, this interesting um, kind of sonic chorus together. Um, as well as experiencing this feeling of collaboration among these, these different people. That is me. I've, I've got a few projects that I've done here. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not trying to be um, self-centered, but it's easiest for me to speak about projects I've done. Now, I mentioned this hardware and sensors here because it's an interesting development. Um, it's really, really fascinating and fun thing to, to work with. It's not that connected with P5 because for your assignments, you can't use extra hardware, but I just want to mention it as part of the story of interactive art over the last few years. Um, computational creativity. This is a really interesting one which has taken off, particularly in the last five years. So we've talked a lot about how computers can be programmed to create artworks and create generative artworks that have variation and even how a computer could be programmed to replicate an artist's style. Um, so this is something which has been happening for many decades now, particularly since the 80s, there was a lot of interest there. But it's taken off in recent years because of the application of machine learning able to, to learn from artistic data really quickly. So you see a lot of artists these days playing with uh, deep learning systems like this this kind of producing this kind of image, which is like a, a deep learning systems backwards view about what Australia should be like. Like this image would be classified as being very much representative of Australia, which is quite strange. Um, there's a link to an article about right here, a link to what where this image came from and, and why it looks like this. And you can start to understand that. These systems usually aren't that interactive. Like you have to enter some text and you get out something after some time. The system has to, to think really hard. But there are other computational creativity systems that are interactive. And one example is, is this. This artist, So Gwen Chung, um, has a, many different artworks under this, uh, this concept of doing interactive painting with robots. So she's got sensors that track her movements and, and her um, position in the artwork and the robots are trained to draw in some style reminiscent of what she's doing. And then they're working together to create some kind of overarching artwork, which is a really interesting thing to do. You can follow the link and watch some videos of, of her performances with this co-creative system. Um, another big development in the last five years particularly has been immersive technology, which has become very much more uh, available than it was in the years before that. 
So this is actually a picture I took um, with my colleague uh, Zero here and another colleague Henry. And Henry has been working with VR since the 90s um, and then come back into using AR um, now that there's these new things available. And together with, with Zero, I was working on a sound artwork that would surround this sculpture. This sculpture is called The Great Listening. Um, it's a famous sculpture in Canberra, which used to be outside at the CSIRO building um, in um, Ainsley, but it's been moved to CSIRO near ANU uh, in more recent years. So the way this artwork worked would, would be that you would be able to walk around the, the, uh, the sculpture and hear different sounds coming from these different sound sources. And I composed these sound artworks to go along with it. And you could also go into a, a kind of different mode where you'd be able to mix the different sounds right in front of the artwork. So as part of my research in understanding how we could creatively use um, augmented reality to present sound artworks, not just visual artworks. And someone who's gone further with that is a, um, a name which you might, you might know about, Ichen Wang, who's one of the tutors, uh, who created this amazing augmented reality work called the Sonic Sculptural Staircase. Uh, so Ichen created a model of the staircase in the Hanna Neumann building that you could experience using a HoloLens augmented reality device. And it had um, many different interactive elements that would interweave sound and visuals to let you experience kind of another layer on top of this um, everyday architectural feature that many of us have seen uh, on the ANU campus. So if you're interested in how augmented reality and interactive art go together, ask Yichen, she's the expert. Something which is another thing that's taken off, I guess in the last 15 years, really in the last 15 years, have been smartphones and other mobile devices, which just became so much more useful after about 2008. So in the, the preceding years, there were some advanced uh, phones and portable, very portable laptops, maybe laptops this big or something, um, but they were quite expensive. Not many people had them and, you know, not overall that exciting. But since about 2008, almost everyone has some kind of smart device. Um, so making interactive artworks within a phone or an I iPad has become very, very popular. And this is something which I've done a lot of work in over the years. This is a, a, a musical app called Microjam, which it really is designed to enable everyday people to be creative with music as well as um, their other, other things we're creative with on phones like cameras and text. So you could draw a little squiggle on the screen and then play it back. So if you're interested in that, you can still get it. It's a, an a Apple uh, iOS app for phones and tablets. Um, and I guess maybe some research I'll come back to, but I, I put a, a link in the bibliography about that if you're really interested. And of course, I think I've shown you before my work as a musician working with um, ensembles of users with, with tablets. So you can express a kind of interactive music system on a tablet and then just give them to multiple people and get together and make music together, which is a really exciting and interesting thing to do. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I have been talking about things that are not really to do with your major project. So the, the, the point of this lecture was recent developments that you can't do in your major project, but could be related to what you're doing. And then in the next few lectures, I'll do things which are really available to you within P5. Robotic art, robotic art. Um, again, not something you can do in P5 unless you happen to have a robot, but, but creating interactive artworks that don't just exist within a screen, but that they can be translated into the real world is a really fascinating and interesting thing to do. So this is an image of a, an artwork called The Articulated Head. I'll show you another picture from the front in a minute, but an interesting thing about this image, this is from 2010, it was in Sydney, is that I'm in it. Can you see where I am? I, was like, I need to play the Where's Wally music. This is from 11 years ago, so I look a little bit different. <laughs> oh, 
I'll point it when someone says they've found me, then I will circle my face in the in the photo. I found this online last night. And I just was like, I think I was at, at that event. And then I thought, wait a minute, that's me. No one's going to find me. I'll, I'll point myself out. There I am. And another weird thing about this image is that actually my boss from my previous job, <laughs> my boss from my previous job called Yim Turrison, who lives in Oslo, is here. And I didn't know him at this time. So I met him six years after this picture was, <laughs> was taken, but I can see that that's definitely Yim. Weird, isn't it? Weird times. So it's funny to, to be good friends with someone and then see them like you're in a photo many years before. Um, yeah, beards weren't a thing in 2010. Not such a... <laughs> uh, beards are more popular now. Anyway, that was a good time, a great conference. Here's a picture of this artwork from the front um, with the artist. This is a famous Australian artist called Stellark. Who's, if you want to see some wild art, look up what Stellark's been doing. He's a really interesting artist. He's, he makes art with his body. Um, that's kind of a weird thing to say, but he literally uses his body as part of exhibitions and modifies his body in ways that are even a little bit scary. Um, so it's, a, it's quite a, a, an interesting person to see what he's up to. He, this, this artwork, he was making a kind of interactive version of himself on the screen. So that's some kind of agent version of him interacting with, with people. Um, Oh, someone's got some some crazy blood art going on there. So I'll just I won't put that on the screen for everyone. You can check that out if you're interested. But a cool thing, well, part of the work with robots at that time was this idea that robots are quite dangerous. So this industrial robot is very strong, and you can't be in the same area, the access area of this robot. Um, you can't have humans there because if it if something went wrong, which is very unlikely to happen, but if it moved quickly in the wrong direction, it could hit someone and seriously hurt them. So it, you can see the robot had to be built within this little prison. And before you can go in, you have to like press the emergency shut off button and do all of this and power down everything um, so that you're at no risk of being hurt by this robot. Um, since 2010, there's more robots available now, robotic arms, which are safe to use with humans because they're not as strong and they have better control over their movements. But the, uh, this was, it's all part, part of the performance of this robot, I think, is the fact that it had to be protected and it was dangerous to humans. Um, I've even done a little bit of work with robotic art, but just on a small scale in music. So you can look up my paper about this embodied predictive instrument if you're interested. Um, that's my little tour of a few recent developments that are apart from P5. I can talk more about those, th I'll talk more about the topics data, a life, and machine learning art in the next three weeks. So we'll have full lectures about them and how to do that kind of stuff within P5, as well as lots more examples. But again, if you're interested in this stuff and you want more inspiration about recent developments, have a look at that bibliography I provided in the notes. One, I wanted to give a little technical note before we stop about objects and constructors. A little technical note. Um, the, the thing you might be thinking right now is, well, wait a minute, haven't we looked at objects already? And in fact, we did way back in week five, many weeks ago. Um, but we haven't done everything about objects. And of course, we don't do every topic within JavaScript, but there's one more thing I want to talk about um, objects which is useful to you and might, would be pretty useful in your major project. And you may have already discovered already about JavaScript, but just for everyone's benefit, there's an important, um, an important aspect of um, objects in P5 is how to create them when you want lots of them. So, Right now, we can create the Sally Pokemon object in this method. So let Sally equal, then curly brackets, uh, species Pikachu, level 1, HP 100. So far, so good. We've made one Pokemon. And if you want to make another Pokemon, you have to do, you know, the same thing. Um, you know, let Jeff 
equal, you know, etc. species level HP. Did we do? Um, and it can. There's nothing wrong with this system, exactly, except that it's. If you've got a complicated object, it can sometimes um, be a lot of code to have to repeat all of the the fields of it. Maybe you don't need all of them for every single version of that object. And particularly if you happen to have some methods in here, um, you know, something, attack. If that was a function, in fact. And you had to repeat that method in each object, that would be a lot of extra code. So there's a way of making a function which can make objects for you. And in JavaScript, this is called a constructor. So it's a, a special function that can make objects. Um, here's an example of one, function Pokemon. And then we've got our parameters, species, level, and HP. And then inside the function body, I just say this dot species equals species. So this is, that's the, the parameter, that's the parameter, that's the parameter. And the this bit means this species field belonging to the object which I'm creating. So this is talking about the current object. So then we can use this as follows. Sally equals a new Pokemon with these three parameters, Pikachu 1, 100. So in some ways, if you had to make 10 Pokemon, this would be an easier way to do it than writing out the whole, the whole list of fields for every single Pokemon you were making. Um, you just make up your constructor for your object once and then you can make lots of ones. So we do need, when we're making a, an object with a constructor, we need to use this new word, Sally equals new Pokemon, which tells JavaScript that I'm, I want to make a new object from a constructor now, please. And there's a, I guess it's not exactly a rule, but it's a convention in JavaScript that usually the first letter of an object constructor is a capital letter. Um, a common thing to do. So I've got a few slides just repeating what I just said or some of the important things. I'm, I'm coming to, Jean has a comment which I'm uh, coming to in a minute and then Songshin has a comment which I'm coming to in a minute. So what's going on with new? New is a special word that tells JavaScript to create an object from a constructor. Um, the, that, if you're going to make objects from constructors, you must use new. That's the, the, the word that tells JavaScript to do it. What's going on with this? So this is, this is a special variable name in JavaScript that refers to the current object. Um, I think we've seen this before when we were looking at functions belonging to objects or methods. So the, the Pokemon constructor can make lots of different objects and this is going to be saying not that Pokemon over there that I've already created, this one that I'm making right in front of me. So that's why I say this. Um, in other programming languages there's a similar concept called self, self dot something um, is often used but in, in, uh, in JavaScript is this. It's also like that in Java by the way. You can also have methods within constructors. So here's a Pokemon with a method. This.hello is a function and it's going to do console log hi I'm this.species. Now <laughs> we have the the peanut gallery is really coming out now I'm talking about objects. I'll I'll explain why in a minute. Now this if you're making a method in a JavaScript object, then this dot species is really, this is really going to be useful because it means you can access, access the fields or the values of your object that you're currently in um, as opposed to any other object. So it's, you can make methods that operate on themselves in some way. You could make a Pokemon which draws itself by using its parameters to draw its values. One more little trick I'm going to tell you. Supposing you forgot to make a constructor or you just didn't want to, um, you can actually still make more Pokemon. So if you've got already got a Pokemon called Sally with these um, parameters, then you can make more. Let Jeffrey equal object.create 
a new version of Sally, and it will it will create a kind of copy of Sally, which you can then modify. So there's questions about what you would like to do. Um, now I'll just have a little you know framing discussion about about objects and and constructors in JavaScript. In JavaScript, there is not really such thing as a class. If you're looking at other other languages, particularly for instance Java, um, there is a notation which allows you to make things that look like classes. In Java, there are two kinds of things. There's classes and objects, and classes is like the design template, and the object is the instance of that, an example of it. So the class is the plan. And JavaScript provides a way of doing that thing, but it's not actually real. It's just a it's a uh, a syntax to let people who really like classes still do it within um, JavaScript, where classes don't exist. So, my I'm teaching you how to do this in the JavaScript way because that's the way that JavaScript works. If you want to use classes, you know, go use some other programming language which has class objects um, design in the in the object oriented um, kind of par programming paradigm. Um, the <laughs> I'm I'm breaking Gene's um, Gene's brain right now. He's just written one one single letter. Um, <laughs> the um, I can have a go <laughs> about the instruction. Ah, oh, yes, Gene has put something on Discourse about JS classes, but they're not real. They're just a way of writing classes. So this is how we make object constructors in JavaScript. I mean, my my reference here is um, is the MDN docs, which is pretty much the canonical like um, way we talk about JavaScript. And if you want to see what the like the most correct ways of doing things are, I suggest looking at these documentations. And I also suggest that um, you can. Look at the. Oh, there's another article about the object model in JavaScript. If you're really a, a deep hacker, um, classes uh, object. I have misspelled objects, which is embarrassing. Working with objects. Details of the object model. Um, this sort of gives some overview about how the object model works differently in JavaScript than in Java, in particular. Um, it's it's really not the same kind of system, uh, but JavaScript is designed in such a way that it it wants to be everything to all people. So it provides these alternative syntaxes so that you can think that you're in JavaScript, but really you're not. I'm not sure whether that's helpful or not at at a high level, but programming languages are always changing. So that's um, that's how things are. Um, yes, now the. I've told you how to do these objects. I don't think I need to give you a demo. We're now at 102. So I might say that that's the end of the lecture. You can see some further reading. I've again provided this link to, to Ernest Edmonds' short book. Um, a link to that paper by Ben Schneiderman, which is quite interesting. A list of 14 AI artists to do with computational creativity, which is pretty cool. And my bibliography, which you're, you're free to reference, uh, refer to, and use for inspiration for recent developments. So please have a look at those resources, and I will see you folks on Monday for our first lecture on data art. So catch you folks later.